What is going on, Metaverse? So you've discovered Noor and recognize that something very different is going on with this project, but you have no idea what it's all about. Have no fear. I'm here to give you an overview into the economic side of Noor. Now, firstly, if you don't really understand what the project is at all, I recommend you go back to my first video titled, Putting the Sports Back in Esports. This is an overview of the basic concepts of Noor and what they're trying to accomplish. I recommend watching that first and then coming back here to get a much more detailed overview of the economic side of the gameplay around the project. That said, if you already have a general understanding and you want to do a deep dive into what's going on with the economy as a whole, you're in the right place. Firstly, a short disclaimer that this video is going to be long. There's a lot to unpack and I recognize that you may need to rewatch a few times or come back for specific components of the video. So I've added timestamps in the description below. Make sure to take a look at those if you want, or on a second or third watch, go to the section that really interests you directly. Additionally, what I'm sharing with you today has a lot to do with the economy and the financial aspects that go into the gameplay of Noor and the entire platform. However, nothing that I'm sharing with you should be constituted as financial advice. I'm not encouraging you to buy or sell any type of token or NFT. That's up to you. However, if you want to get an understanding of what's going on within the game to make your own informed decisions, I encourage you to stick around. So let's see what Annie knows about understanding the economic metagame of Noor. To start with, remember that Noor separates the economic side of the gameplay with the competitive gameplay, or what we'll call the infra game. Playing on the economic side of Noor is very different than any other Web3 game that's out there today. In order to understand this, we're going to begin with three W questions that we ask ourselves. Firstly, who are you within the economic world of Noor? Secondly, where are you located in terms of the physical proximity within the city to other key atmospheres and events that you're going to be engaged with? And thirdly, when are you within the world of Noor? The concept of time and cycles and seasons is very critical to gameplay, and so you need to understand how that fits together. After that, we're going to wrap up with a deep dive into the fate token structures. Again, very different than most other tokenomics. And lastly, we're going to discuss what constitutes economic contributions that you can make within Noor that are very important to you actually playing in this metagame space. So to become an economic player within the world of Noor, there are two key elements that you need to hold in order to be able to participate. Firstly, you have to be a citizen of the city, which means that you hold an NFT called an Aspect of the Nine. The second condition is that you hold a plot of land, and so therefore you're a landholder within the world of Noor. These aspects and the land that you own together form the basis of all of the economic activity that you can engage in. These two requirements are going to define the who and the where in the world of Noor. So let's start off with the who. Firstly, all citizens of Korra are descendants of the Nine. In the world of Noor, the entire economy is structured as if it's a gigantic city. The name of that city is called Korra. And within that city, there are nine different aspects that have an influence on the economic gameplay. These aspects are going to impact different parts of the world in unique ways. And the aspects are different elements that we would commonly think of in the, world, in the real world. So, it could be something like an architect, or an artist, or a politician. I'll show you the overview of all of them in a little bit, as well as what their actual impacts are on the economy. But in general, recognize that each one of them has specific powers that they're able to exert, as are all of the descendants of the Nine. So as a descendant of the Nine, what this means is anyone who holds an aspect has at least one element from two or more of these nine that you're able to use to influence the world that you're engaged in. The nine are actually structured as a concentric set of rings moving outward from the core aspects. So what this means is the first aspect of the nine might be simply the profit aspect. This NFT is held by the design team at Noor, and so they're able to influence the gameplay in different ways to ensure that there's appropriate balance within the universe. Anyone who's a descendant of the profit NFT as a second aspect holder, a third aspect holder, a fourth aspect holder, this means that they have some semblance of the power that comes from that core NFT. So as a profit, you are able to gain additional benefits and have additional bonuses in attracting people to play within the Noor ecosystem. 
Each of the aspects or NFTs have the ability to influence the world, and they have increasing and decreasing power levels depending on how close you are to the original nine. In this case, the original first aspects of the nine are the actual nine themselves. These are controlled by the development team at NOR and able to ensure that there's overall balance within the economy and to control the overall meta gameplay. All of the additional nine are descendants from these. And so what this means is as you move further and further away from the center, they get less and less powerful. So the second aspects of the nine are the most powerful player held NFTs that anyone can possess. Additionally, the third aspects of the nine are weaker than the second, but stronger than the fourth and so on as you move outward from the center ring of the circle of power. These additional aspects of the nine have elements that are taken from two or more of the original nine. So what that means is a second aspect might hold a prophet and a warrior element. Both of those are going to give you small components of the power that the original prophet and warrior would have available to them. And so you'll be able to influence the ability to attract new players into NOR, and the ability to control teams and players as they enter the arena to sponsor them in individual tournaments. These are a couple elements that the Prophet and the Warrior respectively give to players. And so by virtue of holding an NFT that has those two elements within the aspect of the Nine, you're able to control that part of the economic metagame within the world. As economic activity is taking place within the universe, the aspect holders are able to engage with it by either bidding or voting or purchasing or transacting in some unique ways within the platform. And so you may want to have control over things like team ownership or marketing of a particular tournament, streaming of gameplay onto Twitch or onto YouTube. Any of these are what I'm calling economic contributions that you can make to the world of Noor. And as such, you're going to be empowered to do so by virtue of the aspect that you own. In order to see some more details, I recommend you jump over to the white paper, which I'll link in the description below. However, for now, just recognize that you'll have an individual power level that you're able to influence within the world and different types of the economy that you can influence more strongly than others by virtue of whichever NFT you hold. This determines who you are within the world of Noor. Additionally, these aspects give you bonuses economically. So you may receive additional rewards if you perform quality assurance and testing on a new game mode that's going to launch if you have an inventor aspect. What that means is choosing your aspect wisely is really important. So I recommend taking a look at that white paper and then going out and taking a look at OpenSea to find out what are some of the second, third, and eventually fourth, fifth, and sixth aspects that you might be interested in obtaining because that's how you intend to play within the economic metagame of Noor. Now that we've discussed who you are in Noor, it's time to focus on where you are. To start with, let's imagine an enormous city sprawling around a great central arena. The lifeblood of the city runs through and towards what's known as the Arena Perilous. This is the centralized stadium that's used for all of the gameplay within Noor. All economic activities in the city are also connected to this one centralized stadium. However, in centralized rings, as you move across the city, there are additionally located secondary stadiums that are going to focus on individual gameplay with a specific title. So remembering that Noor is first and foremost a platform, not a single game, there will be multiple titles of games that players are engaged in at any given time. So imagine a secondary stadium set up for a first person shooter, another one for a MOBA, another for an auto battler, another for a racing game. And all of these secondary stadiums, they're scattered throughout the city. The closer you are in proximity to one of those stadiums, the more strongly you'll be able to influence the economic activities around that individual game. As you move through the city, your location matters a great deal into how you're engaging with the various tournaments, players, and sponsors of each one of these titles. Tickets are constantly being sold, for viewers to watch the esports competitions that are going on, the sponsorship of individual teams and gamers to be able to play in major tournaments is going to be handled through the aspect holders, the citizens of NOR. Additionally, the focus on bringing in new players, on selling and trading lands, all of these economic aspects are things that you as the player can engage in within the metagame of NOR. 
and it matters greatly where you're located. So, within this city, imagine then individualized land plots that are created and sold to players. Each of these plots of land is going to have unique capabilities and characteristics. For the moment, we don't have full details on what those are, so for now, let's just assume that each player has a fairly standardized plot of land. On that land, you'll be able to put key individual elements that allow you to influence the economy of Noor. So for now, let's assume that you have a standard version that's available. As that land plot, don't think of it so much as a fixed spot within the city. Instead, think of it more like a mobile storage for all of your stuff that you're developing over time. Because this mobile storage is going to be moved around, as you'll see, as we go through the land purchasing process. So, for starters, think of it as a plot of land that you are able to put on statues, decorations, buildings that give you different bonuses and the ability to influence things like ticket sales and marketing and team selection and sponsorship and merchandise sales and so on. All of those aspects that would go into a traditional sports game support and the economy around it are going to exist within the world of Nora as well. And your land plot is at the center of how you're going to be engaging with this gameplay. Some of the major utility and others are going to be cosmetic in nature, probably. Uh, but a lot of it will have major impacts on how you can influence the world around you. So let's talk about where your home is going to be and how you get there. As mentioned, the city of Noor spirals out from around the Arena Perilous, the main arena for the end of season tournaments. Additionally, at the start of each season, locations will be announced for each of multiple secondary stadiums that will be used for the gameplay within that season. So let's say, for instance, in the very first season of Noor, there are three game titles that are going to be included on the platform. One is a first-person shooter, the second is a MOBA, and the third is an auto battler style of game. Each aspect holder and land holder will be able to place their land in a specific spot in a draft type of status. So, what that means is the most powerful aspects that have the ability to influence land mechanics are going to get the first choice of selection. So let's say that you're interested in that first season in selling tickets to the first person shooter game. Additionally, you anticipate wanting to sponsor a team for the MOBA. You would want to set up somewhere between those two games. Let's say, for instance, that you were more focused on the first person shooter. When it came your time to choose through the draft mechanics, you would try and get as close as you could to the FPS arena, while also being as close secondarily as you could to the MOBA. This ensures that you'll have the most influence and also benefit the most in terms of rewards from those two stadiums. Now the way that the draft will work, each landholder and aspect holder is going to be given a chance to choose their spot, but it's based on their relative strength of the aspect and which individual elements are included there. So, it always begins with the aspects that are closest to the nine. In this case, second aspects of the nine will be able to choose their location first. Within that group of second aspects, anyone that holds an architect type will be able to choose their land before those that do not. And so effectively, when you choose your NFT, your aspect, you're influencing your draft order for your land positioning. Now, this is only one aspect of the metagame, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that architects are always the best, but if you want to be able to select your location first, an aspect that it contains an architect is one that you would want to go for. So, what this means is in the first season, anyone that's holding a second aspect of the nine with an architect would be in the group that drafts their location first. Then, anyone with a second aspect of the nine without an architect then anyone with a third aspect of the nine with an architect, and so on and so forth, until all aspects of the nine have selected their location within the city. After the first season of Noor ends, my land plot is going to be packed up. What that means is my buildings and my achievements and so on will remain with my lands, but the actual location will disappear. Each season ends with what's called the Eternal Return, in which the entire city of Korra will have its layout changed in preparation of the next season. And so, when Season 2 is announced a few weeks later, the location of all arenas that are going to be participating in that season for different games will be announced. At that point, the second draft for locations of land will be announced as well, and each player will be able to select a new location 
based on the titles of games that are available for them to be near the stadiums. I'm eligible in the same way that I was for season one, with the caveat that based on my success in the first season, I may have a slightly different draft position based on that success for season two. So your intent is to build over time to have a stronger positioning so that you can influence future seasons within NOR. So let's continue to dive into this concept of seasons, and in so doing, gain an understanding of when are you in NOR. This idea of a season is the easiest way to think about the cycle of time within NOR. The overall growth of the platform occurs as new games get added and are able to be played by gamers, and the economy is going to be able to leverage those to run more smoothly. A season is a self-contained microcosm of the circle of life. There's birth, growth, development, stability, and then eventually death and recreation. This cycle mirrors the overall life cycle that humans, economies, and games themselves have. While most projects, games, and platforms struggle with creating a sustainable economy, NOR recognizes that it will be very difficult to ensure that there's a good economy that's in place the very first go around. And so it embraces this concept of creative destruction, recognizing that if you have a system that's built with the death of a token in mind, it's not so critical how you set it up in the first season. You'll have the ability to continue to tweak and iterate on it as you move forward. A season of NOR will last for several months in the real world, and at the end of that season, there's a final permadeath tournament that's going to take place within the Arena Perilous. So, all of the infra gamers that are playing the competitive gameplay, the first person shooter, the MOBA, they will compete either one-on-one -on -one or in small teams within this end of season tournament if they so choose. Once they lose, their NFT for that season will be burned completely and they'll be unable to engage within that tournament anymore. Once all of those tournaments are completed for each one of the games on the NOR platform, the season will end. There will be rewards distributed to the gamers that were able to win and finish well within the tournaments. Additionally, there will be rewards that are given to the economic metagame players as well. But keep in mind that this concept of the season is very finite. At the end, feedback will be taken throughout that season and changes will be made to the platform as we gear up towards the subsequent season. That means that there will be changes to the economy. For instance, there may be a stronger impact of marketers on the next season. Uh, there may be a different way that land is allocated moving forward. All of these will be handled by the economic players of NOR through the governance structure that has been set up. Meanwhile, while all of the infra games are going on, there's a very real world metagame that's taking place at the same time. All of the economic activity within the platform is going to come to finality at the end of each season in a similar permadeath mechanic of its own. So, let's say that I was broadcasting video and streaming from the first person shooter tournament. I'm responsible for sharing that content with tens of thousands of daily viewers watching. At the same time, let's say that a team that I sponsored in the MOBA takes second place in the final end of season tournament. Recognition of both of those accomplishments and contributions would come at the end of the season. And going from that season one of the metagame into season two, I might be moving from a position where I was ranked 150th in the world to 69th based on the contributions that I was able to achieve over the course of that season. This is going to have repercussions on my abilities as I'm going to have a more favored position moving forward in that season two. I'll have easier access and quicker ability, I might be able to bid easier on individual elements that I wanted to pursue for that subsequent season. The more value I create, the more that I'm going to be rewarded. Speaking of creative value, if this video is proving helpful for you, I'd ask you to like or subscribe. This enables me to continue to produce good content for you and other economic players in Web3 Gaming. Anyhow, think of your role as a metagamer as if instead of being a football or soccer player who's on the field, you're acting more as the overall coach, the marketer, the ticket agent, or the player's agent themselves as you're steering the soccer players that are actually engaged in the games. The owner of the New York Yankees baseball team, or an executive of NBC Broadcasting of the Olympics, or a ticket master that's selling tickets to a virtual Super Bowl, for instance. This is your role within the economic metagame of NOR. At the end of each season, there will be real economic winners and losers. 
No one, though, is permanently a winner or a loser unless they decide to drop out entirely of the platform. Your success or failure simply impacts your starting position for the next season. For those familiar with the theory, metagamers are playing the infinite game in Noor, while each season itself is a finite game. For more details on this, I'll leave a link in the description to a great video from Simon Sinek on this concept. But I digress. Coming back to Noor's metagame, at the end of the season, this giant reset button is hit and the eternal return occurs. The economy is functionally obliterated within the game, and a few weeks later it's reformed from scratch with a brand new city layout, new games that are going to be included, new arenas, new governance structures, and new economic rules that are going to be set in place. This brand new reset is also going to influence the Fate token, which is the key currency used within the world of Noor. Now, up until this point, I've intentionally avoided even mentioning the token of Noor, that's known as Fate, because unlike in other Web3 tokenomic structures, the economy does not fundamentally revolve around the Fate token. This is a little bit different from what you're probably used to if you're watching this video. And so, as an aside, this is going to be true for both the fungible token of Fate and non-fungible tokens that you see as well. Now, the token itself is important, to be sure, but it's not the key element players need to consider and be focusing on. Instead, serving the overall landscape and the economy of the platform, the token is going to serve more as a temporary virtual currency, because it will only last through the life cycle of one particular season before it's destroyed. The way the tokenomics work is when a game studio launches a title on the NOR platform, it will create a number of fate tokens based on a dollar value that that game studio is funding. So in order to be featured, let's say that a studio called Really Cool Game Studio, or RCG for short, submits the Big Battle Arena for Season 3 of NOR. This game studio is going to pay $1 million in USDC to NOR as a listing fee for their tournaments, for their competitions to be sponsored on the platform for the duration of the entire season. That million dollars is going to be stored in a vault, and 1 million fate tokens are going to be created as a result of that. So at this point in time, there's a one-to-one -one backing of real-world dollars that has been put in to fund these temporary fate tokens. Meanwhile, let's suppose that there are four other game studios that are doing the same for Season 3. In total, that's going to give us 5 million US dollars that have been put in for the gameplay over this several-month time window. Now, let's also suppose that there are 5,000 total economic players within NOR that hold both an aspect of the nine as well as a land plot. They're going to be engaging in the economy over the course of this season. Each one of them is going to be distributed a number of fate tokens based on their overall position within the economy. So, as you can do the math, that means that on average, each one would get 1,000 fate tokens distributed at the start of the season. The overall top ranked and most contributing player to the world of Noor might get as many as 2,000 or 2,500 total fate tokens for that season. And the last ranked player might start out with only 250 or 300. However, once that begins, they're able to use their fate tokens to make purchases like a broadcast tower for streaming. They might be used to influence the positioning of land within a season. They could be used to bid on rights to sponsor a specific team for the end of season tournament in that arena that I mentioned earlier. As I spend fate, it goes back to the overall NOR treasury. Each fate token that is spent is then immediately offered back up for sale within the world. Remember, we started off with fate tokens being essentially a stable coin or backed one to one with one US dollar behind each coin. As I put those fate tokens back up into the economy by purchasing virtual items that are going to be used for my influence within the world, those fate tokens are going to be relisted by NOR that are able to then be purchased by economic metagame players. So let's say that I'm able to buy a broadcast tower and that costs me 250 fate tokens. Those fate tokens go back into the platform and they're listed. And someone else that wants to be able to obtain more fate tokens for the season because they have a particular team that they want to sponsor for a game, they need to buy those tokens in order to be able to bid the level that they want. So they would then pay an additional 250 to buy these fate tokens back out. Meanwhile, these fate tokens are being purchased and transacted on multiple times so that eventually the fate tokens are backed by 
two, three, maybe even 5x the number of real world dollars behind them that's going back into the overall economy of NOR. Now, when each of those thresholds is hit, for instance, when the NOR token goes from one to one to a two to one ratio, there will be particular steps that are taken at those discrete values. So when it goes to 2x, what that might mean is the NOR tokens are then available to be sold back into the marketplace from players. Up until now, only the NOR platform is able to sell and automatically it does so any fate tokens that have been spent within the virtual economy. But eventually those tokens might be able to be bought and sold directly from player to player. In addition, there may be some other bonuses that take place or impacts when the token goes to three to one or five to one within that season. These economic rules are defined in each season by the community. And so over time, we'll see major evolutions to them until likely a pretty solid equilibrium is reached several seasons into the platform's existence. Now, notice that the platform is always treating fate as a stable coin with a one to one US dollar backing throughout the entire season. Players, of course, are going to value fate at less or more depending on their overall desires. And so they may decide and elect to sell fate at a price that's less than one US dollar outside of the platform. At some points, fate might be in such high demand that people are willing to pay much more than one dollar within a given season. There might be a specific time or event or activity that they're trying to capture on. And so the secondary price is always going to be able to fluctuate. However, NOR is not going to directly recognize or sponsor any additional secondary markets of the FATE token that exist, although it's known that this will happen as the season ebbs and flows. Additionally, at the end of the season, all of the FATE tokens that are in existence from that season are going to be burned completely, regardless of what wallet they're in, and they cannot be used again for a future season. Each metagamer's position in that cycle is going to be carried forward into future seasons and new fate tokens will be issued and the entire structure begins anew. That cycle repeats itself as the overall never ending game of the economy within NOR. So we've touched on some of the ways that you may play economically within NOR in terms of ticket sales, team sponsorship, streaming, marketing. You may be thinking to yourself, this all sounds very interesting, but I'm not sure what I have to offer to a platform like this. I'm not a content creator or an expert on competitive gaming and identification of top players. The good news is I believe that most people will have some talents and abilities that they can bring to bear to the NOR platform. I'm going to share with you on screen a list of some of the key ways that players can influence the NOR economy. And note that while these are all subject to change in the future, we know some of these are already going to be in existence based on the white paper that NOR has recently put out. The balancing could be varied and the overall share of rewards for one individual element might be different, higher or lower. But at the end of the day, if you're able to provide value to the platform, you're going to be able to get some of that value back in terms of the rewards at the end of a season. So a general idea might be some topics like the following. Firstly, can you QA and test software? Second, could you write proposals for governance and structural changes that you believe would balance the entire economy of NOR? Could you design artwork that could be featured in buildings and monuments and medals and rewards for the end of season competitions? Are you able to stream or commentate on gaming content? All of these and more are going to be ways that you can engage within the platform. And so find your niche and you'll be able to ensure that you are competitive within the economic metagame. It might be that you decide to go very deep in a specific area and become the number one streamer on the NOR platform. It could be instead that you want to experience a whole host of these economic metagame topics. And so you may want to dabble in a little bit of everything for a while. Maybe over time you decide that you want to focus on a little bit further. The nice thing is that with NOR, with each successive season, you're able to basically reposition yourself, your land location to individual tournaments and games, as well as the way that you're engaging within the platform and using your fate tokens each cycle. You're never locked in and only able to do one thing forever. So what you might decide to do is pick up a different aspect in another season that gives you elements that you want to participate more in. So you might want to pick up a performer to focus on those Twitch streams. But when that gets boring to you, maybe you sell that and instead you get an architect and focus more on land development. 
The nice thing is there are 15, 20, 50 different small ways that you can influence the platform. Experimenting with each one of these is going to be a great way to learn more about the overall economy of games. Make sure that you stay aware of what's going on by following others that are playing within this metagame, and you'll be able to be competitive for years to come. Wow, this video is quite a lot. There's so much going on within NOR across the economy. We've covered everything from aspects, to land, to seasons, to fate tokens, to the overall economic activities that you can engage in within the platform. I know it's a lot to take in, but my goal is to make some of the more complex topics easily accessible for you to understand and digest. A lot of the elements here I haven't gone into too much detail about because either we don't know fully or they're subject to change based on the overall governance of the community. The good news is I'll be here with you helping to create content and guide you along the way. There's also a number of really good resources if you want to do deep dives into individual aspects. So I would recommend getting involved within the Discord server, asking questions of myself, of the team. I'm going to put links in the description below to the white paper and to the Discord so that you can check those out on your own time. My plan also is to have a follow-up interview with Brooks Brown, the CEO and founder of NOR, and based on that discussion, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into some of these aspects that may be confusing for some of our community members. If you watch this video after that interview has already taken place, I'll make sure to put a link in the description below for you as well. NOR is creating the very first platform that really leans into allowing the metagamers, the economic players, to play in a way that is supportive and helpful to the overall games that are existing on the platform. Because of this, play is completely separated from the infragaming to ensure that there's no crossover within the arenas of the competitive gameplay and the economic gameplay side. The gameplay is always going to be purely skill-based, and the economy is also skill-based, but in a different level. If you stayed this long, odds are that you're probably a metagamer like me, and I look forward to both collaboratively and competitively matching wits with you within the world of Korra and Noor. And now you know what any knows about understanding the economic metagame of Noor. See you in Korra.